thank you so much for joining breakout room number one. Here we are to talk about fab tasks. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then some of my folks are going to jump in and chat along the way. So as Liz said, I'm Sarah Prendergast Wallace. I run the Fab Lab programs for Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Uh, so um, we have two main kind of branches of our Fab Lab. The first one is our stationary lab. So we call it the um, STEM Lab at EPC, which is our East Professional Center. Um, this is really a space just for teachers to learn and trying to get them to do lots of cool new things. Uh, this was all paid for by the Cleveland Cavaliers and Goodyear. So we don't have any like basketball players showing up. People always ask about LeBron. Um, he's not around, sadly, but uh, they paid for it all. So we're very thankful. We do teacher trainings here, um, virtual and in person. We also have a lending library. So teachers who go through those trainings can borrow 3D printers, vinyl cutters, um, heat presses. There's a ton of electronic kits that they can take. Um, next year, I'll have a couple of laser cutters that'll be able to be borrowed out. Um, and then we also do makerspace and media center design. So as we do more with schools, the schools want to have their own makerspaces in them. So then the Fab Lab team works with those principals and leadership team to uh, get cool makerspace in their, in their schools. The other part of the CMSC Fab Lab is our mobile Fab Lab. So it started off with the, the mobile Fab Lab and then the Cav bought us that awesome room. Um, we have a 28 foot long tractor trailer. It's the second mobile fab lab in the country after the first one that came um, out of MIT. So she's an old girl. She's about 12 or no, she's about 11 years old and she's still trucking. Um, that being said, if you've been in one of the newer ones, this one is not as nice, but we love it very dearly. Her name is Bertha. Uh, go around to schools, do great activities with students. And it also, it's, it's a great tool for students to be engaged in the, um, you know, get, get to see what digital fabrication looks like, but it really, for me, serves as an advertisement to get teachers to come and do the workshops. So they want to say, well, when will you be back? And I say, oh, I'm not, I'm never coming back because I've got 68 other schools to go to. But if you come and learn how to do 3D printing with me, you can do this on your own every day. And that's kind of how I got, as um, Liz said, my, my, my crew of misfits, um, my teachers who are willing to do all this crazy stuff and hang out with me all summer and make lesson plans. Here's some of them. It started off as a STEM fellowship program, again, sponsored by the CAVs. Uh, these teachers have come to summer planning prep periods. They have stayed after school. They have learned how to use everything from, uh, you know, Tinkercad to Silhouette to laser cutters. They've brought me tools that I don't know how to use. Um, one of our teachers is like the queen of donors shoes. It's just unbelievable what, what these people, what these educators have really brought to the table. Um, and what we've done this summer is 12 of them have gotten together and come to the lab every single Wednesday for the past month and have worked together to create new fab lessons. So I have a repertoire of about 20 or so really solid lessons that I've been doing with teachers over the past six years that I've been with Cleveland Metro School District. But this summer, by getting these 12 teachers in a room, we've created 20 new lessons that I think that each of those people could have done a version of those lessons without each other's input, but seeing the conversations that have happened and the um, collaboration that has happened between each the, the teachers has really just kind of taken the, each lesson to a, to a whole new level. All of our lessons follow the TPAC model. So when uh, teachers or administrators who might not necessarily drink the fab Kool-Aid ask like, what are you doing? And what is this maker education shenanigans? And are you are these kids really ever learning anything? I always bring up TPAC. This is a maybe not as well known pedagogical theory or, or um, methodology, but as soon as you Google it, you see tons of different research out there about how content, uh, combining content knowledge, pedagogical, pedagogical knowledge, and then technical knowledge really um, creates this special intersection called TPAC, or in our case, FabPAC, where students are not only learning content, they're learning social emotional skills and 21st century soft skills, but then we're also teaching them a technology that could impact their overall life, career, um, exposing them to manufacturing and different fabrication opportunities. So everything's got to do with TPAC. 
And then everything also, all of our projects are also very kind of abstract and transdisciplinary. So in our uh, community of practice this summer, we talked a lot about taking projects from that interdisciplinary space to a transdisciplinary space. So all these projects down at the bottom, either mono, multi, or interdisciplinary project, those are all really standards driven. It's thinking of, well, what, what standards can I combine from science and math and smush them together to make a project? But instead, we've taken this transdisciplinary approach, which is saying, what's a really cool thing that I could teach my kids about? I'm gonna teach my kids all about pirates and I'll spend an entire month looking at education through the lens of pirates. And through pirates, we can get to math and history and social studies and cartography and all of these different things. So all of our projects take this kind of transdisciplinary approach, which again, might not be the most well-known or well-utilized pedagogical methodology, but as soon as you start throwing these words around and why it's better, I think even some um, stubborn administrators might kind of come along too. Um, I already talked about that, sorry. So all of the pro um, we don't have every single technology uh, in our fab lab, but we do a lot with 3D printing. We have the most 3D printers. We have about 50 3D printers across the district right now. Um, and next, within the next two years, the Cavaliers as their last kind of present to the district will be putting a 3D printer in every single classroom, or every school's media center. So we're getting 102 new 3D printers that'll be in media centers across the district. Um, as far as I know, we're the first like big urban district to do that. So I'm pretty excited about it. We also have um, laser cutters. So we've got two on our mobile fab lab and then every year we're getting more and more uh, glow forges, the smaller laser cutters in schools. So I would say right now about 10% of our schools have access to laser cutting on a regular basis. We do a lot with vinyl cutters. Uh, we do have a couple of the big Roland ones uh, in the fab labs, but we have uh, silhouette cameos are the ones that the, the mobile fab lab and the, um, the, the that we can lend out to folks. I think they're way better than crickets. I think they're much more clo closer to a um, professional design software and just a just a better machine. So if you're on the cricket train, that's fine. But if you're still indecisive, come over to the to the silhouette club. And then we 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 do some stuff with electronics. I got to say, this is my personal weak point. Um, for those of you who know Corey Rice, he used to be in Cleveland here with me and. I was better at electronics when he was here to bug me and help me, uh, but we're getting better and we're trying new stuff with electronics each day. So um, just as an example, before I invite some of my teachers to talk, this is a project that started that we've all probably seen before. It's a really traditional or really not traditional, um, popular 3D printing project to have kids create a model of the layers of the earth. So this was something I did with teachers um, like my first year with the Fab Lab. And the students went through like a worksheet to figure out the, the scale factor that they, they would need and how big each layer would be. So what we I challenge these teachers to do is take a project like this, maybe something that they've been doing in their regular core content classes and kind of elevate it to that transdisciplinary space. And in order to do that, we, we use these maps the, or these webs, these fab webs. So we take this relatively traditional science project and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a 3D printed project, right? You've probably done this, some people have done it with uh, with edible things or with clay or Play-Doh, but we can take it to that next level by filling in these webs. So instead of just thinking about this as a geology science project, we're gonna try to think about it in terms of all of these different subject areas. So we already said for math, you can do uh, scale factor and fractions to get kids to cover those content standards while doing this project. You could also introduce them to the four color theorem, a really interesting mathematical um, principle that says any map can be colored in with only four colors and no, no like colors will touch. For reading in ELA, you could have them um, read around the world in 80 days, kind of thinking about the maps, which goes into social studies, who's making these maps, what's the history of maps. Um, there's a lot of injustice around maps. So there's a lot to kind of pry apart with there. We already talked about the four color theorem, which also called, goes into art and color families. How, what's the best way to color your map? I'm sorry, color your model to get your information across. 
Um, one class that I did this with had a full on debate of spherical earth versus round earth, and they had to take a stance on one side and debate each other. And then, of course, there's the digital fabrication component and the design process of going through and doing some communication with the iterative design process. So you really can see how one little project that maybe would take three or four periods in a science class can really blow up into a much longer, much more in-depth and interesting project. So this is just one example of taking a kind of, like I said, traditional project, making it bigger, making it better. Um, so what the, the community of practice teachers have done is we have built 20 projects and actually there's about six more that are still in the works. So we have this nice repertoire of teacher made projects. Um, I'm really proud of these projects because I didn't, I didn't make them. Like I, I do this all the time, but working with these teachers who are not fab teachers, they're not fab folks. These are art teachers and um, computer teachers, science teachers, English teachers who were able to create these really great lessons. So um, our website is cmsdfablab.org and you can uh, go onto it onto your own computer um, or you can just kind of hang out and watch with me. But on our website, there's a bunch of stuff with the different programs that we run. There's things for like what our schedule is for running workshops and professional developments through the space over, um, over the summer. And then underneath this projects plan, there's a big old a PowerPoint presentation, which if you know me, you've seen this, I've been slapping it or, or slinging it at these conferences for years now. But under the fab project plans is where all of these new lessons live. So at the top, these are the ones that I've created, which yeah, you can go look at those whenever you want. But down here at the bottom, these are the new ones. These are these CMSC teacher written projects. Um, and instead of me talking about them, I'm actually gonna invite some of the folks who are either in the lab with me, I'm not there, but a bunch of the teachers are there. You can see them hanging out together. Um, and then some folks are joining us virtually as well. So um, Jacqueline Vance, who is a former middle school science slash math teacher, next year she's gonna be taking on a uh, engineering role at her school. She's gonna talk about one of her projects. So uh, Jacqueline, which one do you want me to open? Um, you can go ahead and open the food sourcing one. Uh, okay. Um, so like Sarah said, uh, we all went through a very similar approach where we, you know, thought of some sort of topic idea and then from there connected it to multiple subject areas to then create some sort of transdisciplinary um, plan for, you know, whatever that content strand was. So um, for mine specifically in the middle school level, we read a book where the students learn, it's called The Omnivore's Dilemma, and the students learn all about, you know, food choices, where our food's coming from, different stuff like that. Um, so for this specific project, knowing that that was something we were going to do this school year, I sort of wanted to think, how can I, you know, tie what I'm doing from an engineering standpoint and a digital fab standpoint in our makerspace area um, to, you know, that and then as well as the other subject areas. Um, so for this specific one, uh, it's focused mostly around social studies and ELA content, and then the connections that are embedded throughout that other, you know, teachers who also teach those subject areas, if they're willing to do a uh, unit together, can um, connect in science, math, computer science, and art. Um, so for food sourcing, sort of where my mind was going with that um, in science, you know, talking about the nutrition, because in middle school, they're learning about cells and bodily systems. So how does that play into, you know, the food choices, um, food labels, and the process of food, you know, coming to you in order to eat it? Um, and then sort of seeing in social studies, agriculture over time in America, that farm to consumer process that's sort of happening. And then what does that look like around the world as well? Um, like I said, in my um, specific class, we read the omnivores dilemma, but um, there was a few others that I found out there that sort of touch on like the ethics of the process, like of our food system. So that was the bet the farm and the farmer's lawyer that could also be tied in. Um, and then in our specific curriculum, there's uh, an essay that they can do with omnivores dilemma that deals with the ethics of the food system. Um, and that can also be applied to the two other books as well. 
Uh, in terms of art, there was a lot of mural representations about ethics and agriculture and also using food as the art. Um, and then for the digital fabrication piece, sort of connecting it, um, since I'm teaching computer science as well this school year, I thought the eighth grade could create a local food app where they talk about places you can go to get local fruits with different pinpoints that you can click on, um, creating apparel to support local food sourcing um, and using vinyl cutters um, for that as well. And then in math, um, sort of looking at the economics of the agriculture and where the money's going and how that's getting to, you know, different foods to come in from different places and um, then sort of analyzing that through the lens of the financials. So that is how it can connect to multiple different areas. Um, the specific focus for this one was, again, like I said, on social studies and ELA. So just pulling from essential questions about food is where that sort of comes from. Um, so students would work on activities where they're learning about where is their food coming from, where is li different livestock being raised throughout the world, creating maps to sort of keep track of that as a way to open an intro about where our food's actually coming from while they're simultaneously reading the book Omnivore's Dilemma in ELA. Um, and this would be happening in social studies. And then after, you know, students learning about where the food comes from, they would move into where, how are we actually getting our food? Um, how is the food system supporting that? And what does that look like? Um, and then the last essential question after doing a few lessons on how we are getting our food, um, students would actually dive into the food ethics that play a role in the growing, manufacturing, and distributing of food in America. And so there was a great documentary called Food Inc. that I thought um, students could analyze sort of a lot of the data that comes from that and then use that to sort of answer the um, writing prompt that they would end up doing as their assessment. The other part of the assessment, um, there's, so there was the writing assessment and then there was the um, project-based assessment where they would either be working on the app or other choice projects such as creating an invention that would help the food system um, using a vinyl cutter, laser cutter or 3D printer. And then so some other extension opportunities would, like I said, was talking about the nutrients and bodily systems and how they would properly function um, based on food choices. In ELA, they would be reading the omnivore's dilemma. So a lot of what they're learning from that book would then be tied into the social studies lesson, mathematics, the economics behind agriculture, and then in art, the ethical murals. And those are some resources that helped me develop this, as well as some of the resources that were mentioned up above in the actual um, procedures. Jacqueline. Okay. So these, um, we're going to go through a couple more, but this is a really great example of what a Fab Lab project actually looks like in a classroom. Um, I think we as Fab people hear a lot about Fab projects all the time. You, you see, them, oh, here's a cool project I did. Here's a cool project I did. But we don't really get to talk or see the example of what that actually looks like in the classroom. What is the day-to-day -day content instruction look like? or the day-to-day um, -day, like classroom activities or ha classroom happenings. So this is a way of, instead of just seeing, hey, here, here's uh, the, a picture of the end goal of a project, really looking and breaking it down um, for a teacher to use in their classroom. Thanks again, Jacqueline. I'm very excited about this project. Can't wait to see you do it and other teachers across the district and uh, you know across the country and the world. Next, we're gonna hear here from uh, Lynn Carney. Lynn is a gifted itinerant in, in CMSD, which means that she shares a couple of different schools and um, goes and pulls students out and works with gifted students. Uh, Lynn, which project would you like me to open for you? Uh, Lorna and I are gonna talk about the climate change escape room. Oh, cool. Did you guys work on that one together? Yes. Oh, awesome. I didn't know that. I will add your name to it, uh, Lorna. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. So Lorna and I wanted to work on an escape room and we thought that climate change would be a good content area to start with. So we're looking at a lot of, of course, science standards, but a lot of the other skills reach into math and social studies and ELA and of course, FAB. Right. So I am somewhat new to the FAB world, um, trying to come up with some ideas of how to 
take a PBL. PBL is something that I'm pretty familiar with, but trying to take PBL and figure out how to make it fab uh, with materials and tools that will be useful for our teachers here in CMSD was somewhat of a challenge for me. So this kind of pushed me. I got lots of great ideas actually creating this project. So we'll show you our web and how we made this project transdisciplinary. Okay, so of course our main content is climate change knowledge, um, but we're going to look at it through different lenses, including a math lens, looking at some of the data around climate change, a social studies lens, looking at um, climate change over time and laws concerning um, climate change. And then we start to look at the production or the product. And for the product, um, we're gonna hit some of those ELA um, standards with um, writing the story behind the um, escape room, uh, writing the rules of the escape room, um, having students um, make an elevator pitch to, to teach others about the escape room, kind of marketing the escape room. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna make it fab with some ideas about how you could include um, 3D printing, uh, or paper circuits uh, to kind of push the escape room into a fab um, model. Fantastic. Yes, make it fantastic. I also like to point out, um, you may see the icons that are on the screen. If you look at science, there's one that looks like a flower that says detail and over time. Some of you may be familiar, but they're from Sandra Kaplan's model, depth and complexity. And it's something that we use with our gifted students but it's also something that could be used in any classroom just to uh, stretch students thinking and to get our, our scholars thinking more deeply and wider um, into different areas. So the icons are just there to remind the teachers as well as the scholars where there are connections. Like if you look between science and math across disciplines, that's something that we do normally throughout our teaching. It's not another thing uh, but sometimes people just don't realize exactly what you're doing and how you're processing your thinking. So below we have um, kind of some of the essential questions and going into what our lesson would look like. So we're going to ask like, what is climate ch change? What are the effects? Um, what are some of the things that we can do to harm or hurt our planet? And so to start off our lessons, we're going to start with a soul, which is a protocol in which students are faced with an open-ended question. Mm -hmm. um, there's links here for a soul that um, we wrote on climate change. And it's just a one hour um, open-ended time for students to research. And there's a protocol that is outlined in the soul that just walks them through how to share resources, um, communicate their the information that they have gained. Um, do you have anything to add about this? Yes, one? when students work with the soul, if you're not familiar with the soul, they work in small groups. The students decide the groups that they're going to work in. They decide the roles in the group and if they're working in a group, that group doesn't work for them. They can go to another group. And it's only one class period, they decide how they're going to share their information with their peers and they learn from one another during this time. So our second session, we would more focus on some of the products about climate change. So this is where you're gonna have students start producing things that will be part of the escape room. So first we're gonna focus on producing things that are of content, things like infographics or data, I'm sorry, I didn't know that popped up. <laughs> Things like infographics or data, um, and then um, adding details that they learn from their soul or as they're continuing to research questions that they come up with or um, things that start to interest them, they'll go in the direction that um, they have as far as their interests. Mm -hmm. And then the third session, we're gonna start the design of the escape room and starting to get into the clues and puzzles. And here's where it starts to be a little more fab. Mm -hmm. So um, first we're gonna you know, teach students what is an escape room, 
um, watch some videos. There's videos all the way down to elementary students, middle school students, and high school students that um, are doing escape rooms in classrooms. And then um, there's some resources for what escape rooms might be. Um, there's some different examples, sorry, of escape rooms. And then you're gonna have to have students start to form groups. And you can, you can either have each group do their own escape room, or you can have each group do one element in a escape room that everyone's gonna to contribute to. And so let's talk a little bit about some of the fab products that we have. Um, on the screen, you'll see one of the products is, is a slide puzzle that you can 3D print that would have uh, a message or a clue embedded in it. Um, we were able to find some information about 3D locks or keys that students can use, or even using paper circuits to create, um, you know, if they connect it correctly, follow the clues to connect it correctly, a light will light up indicating that they've solved that puzzle. And then you can also have students create like 3D coders, like th think of one of those like old coder rings that the students would spin. So you can have them create like a codex, um, you know, that would help solve one of the puzzles using a 3D printer. And we've linked a lot of resources here um, that you could use or that you could share with students or have them, you know, go through come and up with their own. come up with their own. A lot of times we find that once we give students the basic, the bare bones minimum, you'll find that they come up with way more ideas than we ever could have given them. And then they be, we become the students, which is great because with, again, with a PBL, we want them to take ownership of what they're learning and to be able to transfer that learning into in an interdisciplinary way. Okay, so now we have the content and we have some of the 3D um, products and we're gonna put that together into like the story or the escape room. And so this section, the fourth session is all about creating like the story, like how are students going to navigate or know where to go in the escape room? How are they gonna go from clue to clue? And so this section is just about how students would create a flow. Um, and this is where you're gonna pull in a lot of your ELA standards, having students, um, you know, write some paraphernalia. Oh, they find a letter, they have to, you know, write the letter out that gives the next clue or have students design um, a poster that's gonna be hanging in Canva that they can get clues off of. Um, so students, this is all about like creating the story behind the escape room. Um, so of course, the last thing to do is to have students play and participate in the escape room. Um, they can go through it together as a class. You can invite other classes or younger classes. Maybe this is something that you have um, done on a lower level so that it's accessible to grades below you. You could host a family night. You could publish the escape room. Um, and then in the end, we wanna have students complete the exit tickets that just goes through and um, asks the students about what they've learned as far as content, challenges that they've had as far as fabrication, and any extensions like things that they found that they were particularly passionate about that they wanna take further. We've included a lot of resources, including resources on content for climate change and resources for fabrication um, some of the, the ideas and examples that we gave throughout the lesson plan. There are many, many more. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lynn and Lorna. This one, I feel like would just be so much fun and you could spend a year and a half just doing this. I think it's important to point out also that while there are all of these different, um, you know, we've got eight different things coming out of the webs that not every teacher is going to hit on every single one that I as a math teacher might focus more on the math, science and throw in some social studies one year. And then maybe the next year I did it, I would say, you know, I'm gonna do the math and I'm gonna do the art and the reading this time. So it's not, it, you don't, every single um, bubble doesn't have to be hit, but it's nice to be able to fill those in. So no matter which teach, what you said, what, what subject you teach, you could read through the lesson and think, oh yeah, I could throw this content in from my subject area. Thanks again, Lynn and Lorna. That one is very, very fun. Okay, next we're going to hear from uh, Bernadette Greenwald, who's a technology teacher. And um, you're gonna talk about- Board games. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, so this lesson is um, basically having students create a board game that ex um, examines and analyzes um, the different cultures of the world. 
Let me preface this by saying that um, this is done in conjunction with um, social studies, math, and ELA. A lot of times, um, part of the social studies curriculum for sixth graders, it's the cultures of the world. So they're learning their content knowledge in the classroom. And um, students come to me maybe once or twice a week. Um, and so we are going to be doing the digital fabricating part, um, utilizing um, that content information. So students are gonna be creating, um, for starters, they're gonna be creating um, a board game. So they're gonna actually create the board. They're gonna create the pieces, the pawns, and they're also gonna be creating um, question and answer cards. So when we start by doing this, we start by saying, um, you know, we're, this can be tied into, you know, with creating the questions, actually, you know, figuring out how to write a question so that way it's, it can either be open-ended or there's actually going to be a real live answer that goes with it. We're gonna talk about actually writing directions for a game. Um, when we talk about art, we're talking about designing game pawns, an overall logo for your game, design, design the game board. Um, I'd like to say that this can be adapted to any content area. When I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about making like a general game and then for every content area, we're adding more game cards to it. So you're changing the game up every single time to increase learning. Um, for digital fabrication, it's definitely, you know, 3D printing and modeling using Canva and laser cutting. Um, then we talk about math, you know, scale factor, fractions, color design, all those, those things. When we start, we're gonna talk about, you know, essential questions. What are the rules necessary and how do they influence the outcome of the game? How does the game board design add to the overall game integrity? Why do people play games? So once we discuss those essential questions and understand game design, we're gonna actually take um, a study, we're gonna study Candyland for a minute um, during the first class session, and we're gonna talk about the outcomes, um, those game pieces. You know, if you like, you know, you land on um, the swamp, you have to go back. So we're gonna be creating game rules. What kind of rules do you want in your game? Um, for class sessions two through four, begin designing the game, um, either in Canva or drawings. Um, I've given an example. And then really deciding how you want this to look. So when you're talking about game integrity, you're talking about if you roll, if you roll three and you have to go back to spaces, and then that, when you land on that one, you don't want it to say lose a turn. They're already getting the consequences by moving back two spaces. You don't want the person to always feel that they're not going to win. So that's where, um, you know, the understanding the design and the outcomes, those things take in place. Um, if you're doing this through drawings, you can just print the game board. Um, if you're going through Canva, this would be a great opportunity for you to let, use a laser cutter. And then they actually have a wooden representation of their game board. For classes five and six, um, design game pawns in Tinkercad. I talked to them about how the, the pieces have to be embedded, um, the different shapes, if, you're, if it's um, a vertical pawn versus just a round disc. Um, and then, Classes seven and eight, they're creating question cards, either in Canva or slides. Um, they're designing it to almost look like a um, trivial pursuit card. Um, when I envision them doing it in slides, it's a slide and then um, it's a rectangle space, it has a question and then the four answers. And they can actually, once they're printed, fold it so it's back to back. So question, answer, that kind of thing and play the game. Um, like I said, you know, you could, this could be very easily adapted for um, um, cells and understanding the different parts of a cell. And so you could definitely just have like the funk, the, like, for example, mitochondria and all the, like, and then one of the answers in the back um, have four answers. One of them 
is obviously going to be the answer, but then it really makes them think. So you doesn't even have to be a question per se. It could be a picture and they have to identify what part of the cell. I mean, it's definitely adaptable to whatever um, content area you see fit. Thank you so much, Bernie. That um, we only have seven minutes left, and I'm bummed about that. So I'm going to ask Heidi and Alicia and Rachel to talk for about 90 seconds each, which I know is going to be really hard for Heidi because for her dinner party for pets, she actually made two totally separate lesson plans because she couldn't, you know, fit it all into one. So do you want to talk about dinner party, Heidi, or do you want to talk yeah. about? Uh, okay, which one? Um, pull up the social studies one, actually. Okay. You got 90 seconds. I'm going to time you. Go. Yeah, I'm good at that. Um, so dinner party for pets was, I broke it down into English and social studies. And this one, uh, because it's a bit more creative where you are looking at societal rules. Um, I use animal farm. You can see from the picture there, because how were we able to, uh, allowed World War II for, to happen, for example. So, you used a lot of, sorry, you would use a lot of like social norms um, and then how those influence society, different cultures, uh, the rise and fall of different cultures. And so from history, you would look at it as a, you know, look at the ancient Greek and Roman empires and their rise and their fall, um, what caused them to be so successful, but then fail in the end. Um, and then with English class, you could tie in to create a story that the students could uh, look at where they're coming up with their own idea about a time where maybe they were uh, unjust uh, in a situation where they were, you know, unjustly treated um, or something that they wanted to change. Uh, it can tie into the Black Lives Matter movement. It's a lot of stuff that's happening right now that it can tie into. Um, and then I, it also kind of goes hand in hand with like, I want to do this as a science teacher with my social studies teacher at the same time. So the kids don't have to learn completely different content. Um, and if they can read animals, uh, animal farm in English class, they can bring it into social studies. And then we can also talk about food chains and how the transfer of energy moves around. Um, and then, you know, tie in the math part of it by calculating that transfer of energy, how much energy is actually transferred from one source to the next. Um, and then really SEL stuff. So they could create their own uh, rules and guidelines for their classroom. How do they think they could establish a fair and just classroom so that everybody is treated fairly? Did I do 90 seconds? You did such a great job. And also <laughs> like, I very much inter invite all of you to go and click on Heidi's lessons. She has put so much content in there and she brings up a really great point about how these do lend um, a wonderful opportunity for co collaboration with other teachers in your school. Felicia, you wanna talk about um, rainforests? Yes, so hello everybody. Seconds, um, seconds. Um, let's go. All right, go. So I actually, this lesson is basically me saying in the face to traditional teaching, I actually taught uh, the Amazon rainforest and those pictures you see are my actual students, but I put a steam twist on it and that is how I was able to get what I could out of them. So this was just great for me because this is the flip version of what they should be doing instead of the traditional way. So um, I'm straight transdisciplinary after this. Uh, as you can see, when we go to social studies, we look at scholars with research and create a diagram using layers of the rainforest. And then we go down to science. They will research biome of plant life in the Amazon and then construct a mini booklet. The possibilities are endless. Posters, like everything that we did, basically showing how you turn those plants in the medicines, which help us today. Um, let's see, math. So they would look at, they would take math and compare deforestation in different rainforests to the Amazon. They can do that using a 10 slide PowerPoint to show the causes and then use real time statistics. And those will be different ways. And then they can also add how to combat deforestation. The writing and reading component, because I'm an ELA teacher and we have to get that in, it's actually um, will help drive because they've never been to the rainforest. So it'll help them when they're recreating the rainforest, the book, The Great K-Pop Tree, awesome, awesome book. 
by Lynn Cherry and Rainforest Survival Guide. Um, also, there is another book. I can't think off the, off the top of my head, but I will be injecting it in there. Um, but basically that will really get them a visual. I also love to do real world artist connections. Um, they'll study an artist, Henry Russo, who also had never been to the rainforest, yet he became one of the greatest artists creating renditions of the rainforest. So really what that will do is help those students who tend to, you know, have anxiety when approaching things in a non-standard way. So we'll definitely visit that. Um, the I'm art. You off. All right, so I'm done. Guys, you got to go look at this. She has done so much work and Felicia has been fighting the steam fight in an English classroom for too long on her own. And we got more, more folks doing it now. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, Rachel is going to talk to us for one minute. I'm sorry, Rachel. Would you want to talk about the, um, which one? The found art or the three, the lithophanes? Let's do the lithophanes if that's okay. It's so good. It's such a great lesson, guys. You guys, yeah. you guys <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. You have one minute. Okay, I'm gonna be try to be really fast. So this is a little wordy, um, but they're called generational 3D printed lithophane, and basically a lithophane is a 3D printed photograph or a 3D print of a 2D photograph. So and then light is somehow placed behind it. So they're um, you know from way back in the day, but a modern version of it is with the 3D printer. Um, and so the content covered would be mostly art, but you could hit science and math. Um, and so with science, you could hit it with um, circuits and topography, which I thought was interesting. It looks very similar. So you could discuss, uh, you know, topographical map, maps. Um, with math, um, there's the Fibonacci sequence. I found a really good resource of a worksheet um, that has a photographer named Ansel Adams and like how he used it in his art. So then the students could, you know, research the, the golden spiral and think about that when they take their photographs. Um, and then I just have other few ones like SEL, coping with change. Um, so I, I hit a, a few other areas. And then she put in just wonderful, like very detailed procedure of connecting photography and how you can then take students' photos. Um, she Hers is really talking about generational and like looking at a photo of a student, their parent, and their grandparent are looking at people from different generations within their communities. There's about a zillion resources in here. So as someone who doesn't know anything about this, I feel totally prepared to teach this lesson with all of the material that you put in there, Rachel. Nice job. So, so proud of you. Um, I just wanted to shout out again for all of the members of the COP. I am so proud of you guys. These are such great, great projects. Um, if you haven't already, please go to cmskfablab.org. You can sign up to get our newsletter to get more projects. Um, and I think that that's everything. Um, there's, there's even more on here. If you haven't clicked on there yet, there are, like I said, 18 or 19 projects that the, that the teachers wrote this summer. There's additional projects that I've been working on. Um, so please go look at all of all every single one of these leads to a project that can be used in any classroom. Um, so I think that even if you you've never heard about Black Wall Street, I hadn't before. Um, one of our teachers, Monica, brought this up. It's amazing. Click on it, learn a little bit, think about how you could bring it into your classrooms. Same thing with these community gardens that um, Adam is talking about, creating monsters or alien mashups. Really, th this is a ginormous hive mind resource, and I am so proud of all of the teachers who came together and created it over the summer together.